Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. It's amazing that you've gone from jazz to South Indian classical music, Carnatic music. How did that happen? Well, you know, it's, there's, it's an interesting thing in the sort of middle part of the history of jazz in the 60s. So many musicians were looking at ragas, especially, and in some cases, talas. Um, it just, they, they needed they needed other resources, you know, and so this there's kind of a tradition in the in jazz to do this, um, but you know, like like every other Western kid in the '60s, I listened to the Beatles and okay. <laughs> and uh, of course the fifth Beatle, you know, Ravi Shankar, and um, and I and that was the entryway for, certainly for me, you know. Now, um, how would you describe the Indian classical raga, the concept of the raga in terms of Western music? In terms of Western music? Um, well, you know, we've got these, these two things, these albatrosses, the major and the minor scale. And um, in my classes, I like to refer to that as you know, kind of <laughs> Mr. Rogers' understanding of music, that this happy sound, there's a sad sound, okay. and um, which is utterly absurd psychologically. Uh, music is way more complex than that, um, and I, I like the 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 raga concept of the, the varnams, each one of the tones being kind of an aroma, you know, oh, and okay. and also of course representative of the chakras. So there's there's so much um, there's so much more to to a raga than just a set of pitches. You know, it's a melodic melodic subset. But it's also um, representative of an emotion, a rasa, I, all these, all these other theories and, and complexities to it. So it, I think that is kind of flipping it on its head, going back to Western music and, and saying, okay, well, how does this affect me playing Bach? You know, it's like, well, all right, so I'm playing in the major scale, but what does that mean? You know, so I think of the second scale degree in Bach as something completely different now. Than I ever would have before. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like it's re right. sure, but but the relationship between the second and the first scale degree in Bach now to me is like oh, yeah. Wait a minute. Let's in a way it slows the whole thing down. Right. You know? And do you, do you also keep finding connections uh, between the two music in any way at all? Yeah. Yeah. But I I don't really look for it. You know. Okay. It's it's a funny thing like. I have perfect pitch, but when I go to India, I sort of lose my perf perfect pitch because it doesn't mean anything. Once you have sa, once you have a sruti it, box, sa can be anything yeah, also, it's like right? there, <laughs> and it's not going to change for the whole evening. So right, the next right. three, four hours, you have the same root, you know, for for everything. Um, so it really, really doesn't matter. the The main thing in Indian music, as you know, is the the relationship between pitches in the raga, right? You know, right. and because the raga doesn't change keys ever, um, you know, it's it's a whole whole different thing. I mean, um, an old colleague of mine, Bill Mom, referred to um, these kinds of comparisons as saying, "Well, they're equally solvent, equally important, equally organized systems of music, as opposed to." Oh, it's a universal language, you okay. know. Well, you know what? Uh, <laughs> it's a very different language. Musician, right? You perform also, yeah, yeah. Uh, now we have a group. Uh, yeah, I've got two perform? different groups. Um, one I wouldn't even call jazz; it's more electronic. Our, we kind of go as a psychedelic electronic band. You know, we've got laptops and guitars, and I play piano and 
in children's toys, lots of electronics. And that group is called Crystal Moon Cone, okay. and uh, sort of in mockery of the New Age movement. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and we're you know fairly successful, and we're out there in Spotify and whatnot. But um, and then the other group called Naked Dance, which is um, a trio of jazz musicians, and uh, it's drums, uh, clarinets, bass clarinet, and uh, soprano clarinet. And I play primarily play piano in that group, but I also play a lot of Okay. Gadgets. Okay. play original like yeah. compositions yeah yeah in, in, in crystal moon cone we we actually never write music out oh, and we okay. always improvise we just show up and play concerts usually an hour or so long and we improvise and we never even discuss what we're going to play ahead of time that's really flying by the seat of your pants i mean it's just wow here you go <laughs> and it's very exciting and usually turns out okay Okay. <laughs> um, with Naked Dance, we, we actually work, um, work out compositions and whatnot. We're doing a, a new record uh, next month, all based on uh, Johannes Kepler's theories of the universe. And um, thinking, and this is so related to ragas, thinking of the uh, planets and their um, traversal of their ellipse as intervals. Of musical intervals and so he had this whole mapping in the 16th century about oh well the earth is a semitone so it's da, da, you know but the moon is da, 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 da. really I mean okay <laughs> whatever but he was rounding it out to what he was comfortable with using the musical knowledge of that time and um, and of course in in Vedanta and going way back to the Vedas um, talking about nada the original sound of matter, or the ohm. Um, and I've been talking to phys uh, physicists about this, like ohm, because they use the term Big Bang, you know? Right, right. <laughs> it's like, well, wait a minute. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that India figured this out a long time ago. <laughs> we just never called it that, you know? So I've been, we're wrestling with, uh, in this new record, we're wrestling with those kinds of issues, like the eternal sound okay. and, and their, the connective tissue between all of us. Who among us is not moved by the vast expanse of stars that decorate the sky on a clear night? As a scientist, I see more to the universe than meets the eye. There's an invisible world that lies between the stars, a world whose beauty is revealed in numbers and equations. Often I've wondered if it were possible to guide others to this hidden world, to let them feel the overwhelming awe that I feel. I started this cube in the hopes that through art, others could see the unseen that I see, and revel in the unfolding story of everything. Let us take a tour through this vast invisible net as we let the dark matter speak to us through sound and light. You say you improvise a lot uh, during your performances mm -hmm. here. Now, is it influenced in any way by um, the South Indian classical music? Uh, sure. Oh, sure. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I mean, my teacher in India is, she's very skeptical in some ways about me improvising. 
you know. Cause, <laughs> well, it comes it comes so much later in your instruction too. Right, right. And she still thinks of me as as being about a you know a teenager maybe in okay. terms of <laughs> which is probably true, um, but in the improvisation that for the slow stuff, there is this really gentle caring of tone and just saying oh what is the second scale degree you know is it is it a flat re or is it a you know is this mm -hmm. is it re one re two re three and all these so just just for our viewers to oh, understand sorry, yeah, the, yeah. they might not understand the, what the re you're talking well, about well <laughs> yeah so you've got do re mi like okay. do re mi or sa re ga uh -huh. or one two three call it you know <laughs> dog tree duck i can call it anything right <laughs> okay. it's the same thing but when I, when I improvise um, in the, let's call it Western style, and I am thinking about sari, I really am listening very carefully for all the, the distance between that, the, um, that's primarily the issue, is the distance between sa and ri, which might sound to a listener, you know, as well, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is Sari has a completely different emotional meaning. Absolutely. And that's mm -hmm. that's something the West sort of discarded in about about the nineteen thirties. There's this lecture by Stravinsky at Harvard where he talked about emotion in music as being more or less dead. And you know, that that was the training that I received in the conservatory. It's like, well, you, of course you understand that, you know, emotion in music is, doesn't really exist and that's not what we're trying to do. We're not trying to evoke emotions in your listener. You're not trying to write from your own emotions. You're trying to manipulate intervals or something. And studying Indian music has allowed me the luxury of saying, well, wait a minute, there's this wonderful system of music that is all about human emotion. And it's about your own emotion as a singer, and it's about the human emotion of the listener, and connecting that stuff through music. So then you start going back to the question of sari, which is really, really this urgent sa. You have to get there with that re sari. You can hang out there for a while. Mm -hmm. Maybe go to ga. Fine, mm -hmm. no problem, but. These, the differentiation in the raga system is so much more critical, you know. And the fact is that um, harmony in Indian music is linear because it's a collection of pitches that over time create this kind of ethos, an emotional ethos. And that, you know, in Western music, there's, there's harmony that goes this way. So you kind of clunk it down and go, oh, that's a major chord. So I'm expected to feel happy, if anything at all. But more likely, oh, well, it's a major chord. Well, now I know that. It's an intellectual thing. It's kind of sad. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. It's, each, each person looks at it yeah, <laughs> differently. No, you yeah, know. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but music is music right yeah <laughs> it well, does bring some sort of emotion in everybody but see know? that's the thing is that i in my own lifetime i've seen um in in western european based music that argument has been there that says well emotion we don't, we're not so interested in emotions i mean it's a very classical perspective right. i don't think a pop musician would ever say well mm -hmm. what do i care if people cry or laugh when i you know sing <laughs> they care a great deal <laughs> yeah. and um, so when did you uh, start learning uh, classical the South Indian classical music I, I actually um, had a friend in 91 named Navtesh Johar I don't know if you know Navtesh but he's um, his family comes from uh, this this area and in fact his his father his uncle lives across the river from me in Ann Arbor um, but he was teaching up at Interlaken, Interlaken Arts okay. Camp, camp, and um, he's teaching Bharata Nacham. He's doing a little lack dam workshop, mm -hmm. you know, one or two day thing. And um, we were we were sitting. A bunch of us went out to uh, kind of celebrate him at a Italian restaurant, and he said, "Oh, you should write some music for me. We should do something together." And I said, "Well, you know, I don't really. I mean, I love Indian music, but I don't really know anything about it." And at that time, uh, C.K. Prahalad, a great uh, business 
guru was teaching at, um, at U of M. And he had put a bunch of money into getting students and faculty to India, which is way ahead of his time, because now, actually this year, there's an incentive to do that from the University of Michigan. And so it was just a small matter for me to get enough money to go and to, to launch a project to produce it. We did it in D.C., we did it in India, we did, you know, amazing. But to fully answer your question, I thought, well, I, I, can't, I just can't go to India and get off the boat and start studying. I need to know something, otherwise I'll just embarrass myself. So I asked around, and it turned out there's this wonderful woman named Sharda Kumar in, in Ann Arbor, was a marvelous, marvelous singer. Um, she had a, a class Saturday morning at 7 o'clock a.m. Okay. with a bunch of <laughs> middle-aged Indian guys, <laughs> and I was the token white guy. <laughs> <laughs> but I studied with her for six months uh, before I went to India. I was just in India for five weeks at that time. And then came back, and I, I kept studying with her for 10 years. It was really, I was a very off and on good and bad student. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in, in Gita, there are the three gunas, right? The sattvasic, tamasic, and rajasic. Mm -hmm. And um, the tamasic guna, is, these are characters of the soul. And the tamasic guna is sort of the lazy, slothful thing. So she just ended up calling me Thomas. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but since I've been going to Mysore, um, and you go every year, yeah, right? I, I, every year for the last the... eight years, yeah. Okay, how many how many students do you take? Over the years, I've taken over a hundred students. So, yeah. Oh my God. We stay in a in a hostel that's associated with the Swami Vivekananda Youth Movement, and um, it's it's a great organization. They've done so much for mobilizing the poor and working mm -hmm. deep deep into. Uh, what are called in India, the tribals, uh, what we'd here call Native Americans, actually. <laughs> you know, people that really belong here and live very close to the earth, but had basic needs, um, mostly for health and education. And so this group of doctors banded together, and I got to know um, this wonderful fellow, uh, Nagaraja Rao, who worked with them. And he wanted to study, he wanted to develop a kind of American cultural studies exchange kind of mm -hmm. thing where college students from the United States would come and, and Canada would come and they would study um, study about India whatever that meant you know whether it was sociology wider issues of culture but um, he was a friend of a friend I got to know him and um, I got an unbelievable grant to go to India to Mysore and to interview gurus and yogis here we're going into the homes of these wonderful teachers whose musical heritage, like yours, goes back hundreds of years. And they're saying, oh, I'll give you my time. I'll, you know, yeah, you sing like a three-year-old, but I'll still... <laughs> <laughs> it's true, you know. I mean, they're just starting with the basics. It's really unbelievable that these teachers are just saying, oh, you know. and. No, I'm bringing students who are music majors at a very fine school, so they have studied music their whole lives. So they come in with skills, you know, they're not ranked beginners, and they they grow fast, you know, much to the delight of the teachers. But we go to lots of concerts, and um, you know, we don't we don't eat Western food for an entire month, and. Wow. <laughs> So I, it really boils down to Idlis and Sambar for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great, great Indian breakfast. <laughs> right. So I, I believe you also cook at home. Yeah, sure, okay. sure. <laughs> when you go into my home, well, for one thing, you drive in my driveway, there's Kali, you know, because my house is always under construction. And then <laughs> this is, you put up Kali to, you know, for a construction site. But when you walk in the door, and there's a Saraswati, you know, greeting you and saying hello, you know, which could be interpreted, well, this is a house of a person who reads and who does music, you know. I mean, this is what Saraswati does. So Saraswati is yeah. the goddess of... Yeah, the, goddess of, 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 of learning and of music, music. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and you go into my study and you 
can instantly go, well, this really smells funny in here. <laughs> Like frankincense, <laughs> because I do puja, I do Ganesha puja every single morning, you know, and, and in the corner there's, you know, flowers and things have been thrown around and whatever. So you can't really go into my house without kind of encountering India in a kind of direct way. And of course, on any other night, you know, you go, oh, Sambar is cooking over there, okay. you know. <laughs> All right, now coming back to music, um, mm -hmm. you have your own um, compositions that um, is not exactly a fusion, but no. you, you wouldn't want to call it a fusion. or No, I mean, you know, I'm a trained Western classical composer, but I've got world influences. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I grew up in a, in a culture that, you know, Vietnam was on TV every day as a kid, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, you know, our consciousness about Asia was really you know, very, very present. And of course the music of India was even more present, primarily through the Beatles, but all the all the rock musicians were using, um, even the Doors and the Birds and these bands, um, a lot of those guys studied at UCLA, studied Carnatic singing. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. So you did uh, compose a piece? Uh... I did, I did, a piece called Samyama Trio. Okay. And um, I was commissioned to write it by uh, Jim Jim Umble, he's a saxophonist. He plays with the Cleveland Orchestra, and he's got a group, the Cleveland Duo. And um, I expanded a little bit, so now it's a trio. So it's saxophone, piano, and um, the violin. Anyway, the piece the pieces for those three instruments, and um, I I started sketching this piece, and all I could think of was Hindolam, I this this raga, and. Hindolam is kind of an interesting raga because it's Sagama Danisa. Uh, so there's no fifth scale degree. Right. And, and there's no second scale degree. No, now, this just doesn't happen in Western music mm -hmm. to omit things like that. <laughs> so, um, and there's a kind of ambiguity about what the root of the raga is. But I realized, man, I'm being obsessed with this, this raga. And I'm supposed to write this classical piece of music for these guys in Cleveland. I don't know. So I just let it happen. And I, I got out of the way of my own predisposition and sort of my own rules about saying, well, no, 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 no. There's a time and a place for when I do Indian music. There's a time and a place when I do Western music. Why should that be? You know, why should I be so non-integrated? And... Um, and that opened up all kinds of possibilities. The middle of the piece is very Western, classical, you know, avant-garde or whatever you'd call it, uh, music. But then it has the rhythmic sensibility of, of Indian music. After I disregard <laughs> Indolam almost completely, then it gets into a more rhythmic thing. It's a kind of rhythmic activity that you'd expect from Murdungam or Tabla, but it's not regular. You know, if somebody were to try to put the talum to the end, it would be a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs>
you know, <laughs> I'm not making any money on these records. Um, but, so you have about uh, um, more than 20 CDs? No, I've got 30, you know, yeah, yeah. Wow. I've got six in, in production for next year, yeah. I mean, I just make music, you know, and, and whatever, whatever happens, happens. And um, would you also please sing for us today? Sure, be glad That'd to. That'd be great. Yeah. And uh, you have a tabla player with you today? I do. Yeah, his name is Dan Piccolo. All right. Yeah. So let's go for it. All right. Sarigama padapa sa, sanipama gama risa, sanigama padapa sa. Sani pamaga marisa Teri si ramachin 